fascinating because I always wonder, like science, I kind of understand. My initial interest was the medical examiner part of it. I've always been fascinated with that science. But when you hear, and maybe some of it comes from TV, those things where the detective comes in and they, a crime scene, and they say, well, this looks staged. And I think, how do do you know that? Because (laughs) to me, I'm like, it just looks like a crime scene. Many moons ago, I was in Edmonton on a conference, and the fellows had been called out to uh, death. And when they got there, they went into this basement of this room, and the room had all been polyed. All the walls had been polyed. It was in that laundry room. There was a female victim laying there. She had been shot multiple times in the head, and there was no gun. But there was a pair of glasses that she wore, and they were on the washing machine. A buddy of mine sent the photos of the crime scene up. And I'm like, I looked at him, I'm like, dude, this is, this looks like a suicide. I think this might be a suicide. I mean, it makes no sense because yeah, there's no gun. Times, yeah. There's no gun. And she's been shot multiple times in the head, but everything else about it makes it look like a suicide to me. It was the glasses that got. Just that she took them off? And the way they were, they just, it's just a thing. I don't know. I can't yeah. really explain it. That feeling. It's that feeling. And you like, look at them and you're like, I've seen that before. I've actually seen that multiple times before. Anyways, as the investigation continues, and it goes for quite a long time, we finally arrive on a suspect. In the final analysis, we learn that basically he loved this girl deeply, and she loved him, but she was suffering from a number of different illnesses and ailments, Mm. and she asked him to take, take her life. He actually agreed. She made a video, a plea, she told us that this was okay, that she was consenting to this. They'd experimented ahead of time to see if neighbors could hear what the sounds of gunshots would sound like. And they did a whole bunch of stuff and sort of preparation and plan. And so she chose gunshot? Because I would not make that choice. <laughs> she did. They had tried one other way mm. and she found it too painful. Okay. I wasn't completely wrong, but uh, he was charged with first degree murder. Or did he get it? Or did he get manslaughter? No, he was... I think he took... Um, I think there was a, a, a plea deal that was made. I think he ended up getting second. When you've been to enough things, you can just see when things don't look right. And there's other things that happen at scenes that make you realize that maybe it's staged or that. I, for people that are familiar with what lividity is, it's mm-hmm. basically the pooling of blood. Yeah. or fluids in the body after death. And so if you die on your back, of course, gravity will pull the fluids to your back and you'll get this sort of pinky, maybe even a little bit of a darker purple kind of uh, color uh, to your back. And with lividity, we can see when bodies have been manipulated from one position to another. If you've been to 100 break and enters, the one that doesn't look right it might be the one that's you know staged. They all sort of follow a pattern. It's, it's really hard to explain, actually, but it's just through experience mm-hmm. over time that you start to see things, just like those glasses. Yeah. For me, those glasses were the giveaway. Well, it sounds like an astute understanding of human behavior and what the normal person does in the order of normal behavior and when there's something out of balance. To right. That. Like, so, yeah, I guess normal behavior is if, before you go to bed or before something major right. happens, you're going to take your glasses off. Um, whereas if somebody breaks into your house, you're not going to have that off. I don't think you, yeah, would, that's think, right. you would think to take your glasses off that's before right. somebody yeah. hits you in the head. Yeah. When a new investigation comes in, the, the very first thing that's done is there's the assignment of a primary investigator. There's sort of the first few days of an investigation they're in a briefing room. I call them puzzle builder. And we as an investigative team that are supporting the primary, and we all do because we all take turns being the primary, sure. um, we're out collecting the pieces of the puzzle. As a primary investigator, what will end up happening is, is that you, when you start a new investigation, there'll be a whole bunch of things that you can send your investigative team out to go and collect. Mm-hmm. And when they come back with that information, it will set up for the next round of things that need to be done. 
But let, let me give you an example, Kim. Um, somebody calls and says they found the body of a woman in a home. Get to the home. Um, the officers notice that, uh, um, you know, yeah, there is a deceased female inside and it's suspicious. So the homicide unit is contacted. Say so yeah, I'm assigned as the primary investigator. So once I'm assigned as the primary investigator, um, I'll have a whole investigative team there sitting in a briefing room and I'm going to send everybody else to do different jobs. Mm -hmm. So I might say to you, Kim, I need you to go to the scene. I might send Lacey to the autopsy and I might send uh, Lee uh, to do the next of kit notification. So I send all, th all three of you out. You're my puzzle piece collectors and you're going to come back with the information. When you come back from the scene, you're going to say, okay, no signs for a century. Talk to a neighbor, a nosy neighbor around the corner. She said that she saw a red car sitting on the driveway right around the time that we think this occurred. Okay, thanks, Kim, for that information. Lacey comes back from her autopsy and says, yeah, uh, medical examiner said, yeah, multiple injuries. And we absolutely have no doubt that, you know, whoever did this was very, very angry. And then Lee, who's gone out and done the next of kin, is going to come back and he's going to say, David went out and did the next of kin notification, and this is what I learned. She had been using dating apps. Mm -hmm. um, she had met a guy online at one point in time, according to her mom, that gave her the creeps. He drove like a red chef cavalier or something like that. So all this information comes back into me as the primary investigator I set my next course of action. I think the next thing that I would probably do in that scenario was try and identify who this guy is. So I might say to you, Kim, I need you to try to find the victim's phone at the scene. Let's figure out what apps, what dating apps she was yeah. using. Let's get that stuff over the tech crimes unit. Lacey, I need you to start doing some checks work with the crime analyst. Let's see if we can't dig up Red Chef Cavaliers. Uh, Lee, with that information that you have about the Red Chef Cavalier, I need you to go out and start collecting video in the area. Keep particular mention or mind of the Red Chef Cavalier. Investigations stop and we stop working when the information coming in stops. Right. So if I send all three of you out, same scenario, and you come back and say, I went to the scene and no signs of forced entry. And yeah, it was, it's, it's particularly violent. Lacey comes back and says, went to the autopsy. Yeah, particularly violent. And Lee comes back and says, talk to mom. Um, Mom's been estranged from her daughter for however long. Doesn't know anything about her friends. Doesn't know what she was going on doing. Where do I go with that? Certainly, I mean, somebody listening will say, well, you could do this, this, and this. But this is just a, dem a demonstration yeah. of how it happens. So within the first eight to 10 hours, typically, we have a pretty good idea on if this thing is gonna become a protracted investigation, mm -hmm. meaning that it's gonna take months and months and months to solve, or if it's gonna be something that's gonna be able to be solved relatively quickly. Where we run ourselves into trouble, say our victim is from uh, a community where maybe the police aren't trusted. Well that ultimately affects the type of information that's coming back into sure. us. If our victim is, say, from a uh, organized crime group or is involved with a lot of shady people, that makes our investigations much more difficult. At some point, you did try to interview Dustin, is that correct? Yes. After he was... Now, this was... He called 911 and was brought in. Was it right afterwards or was it like a couple of days afterwards? Or? No, it was that day. It was yeah, super it was. it was super frustrating. Because um well you would expect that a guy that's already told everybody it's what he's done from the communications officer to the um to the police officers that uh first had come in contact with him, that he would it would be easy to elicit the same information in an interview. But yeah. uh he didn't, and so one, the guys on the team were all riding me pretty hard on that. But, you know, he confessed to everybody but you. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, over the years, I've been a relatively accomplished interviewer. Um, I do a lot of interviews now, and I have often have some level of success, but that was different. That was a different one. And uh, when he first came in, Custody was still very, um, only twice in the dozen years of 
the 13 years I've been investigating murders, have I had people stand outside the door. And Just for your protection? Or yeah. Feeling, yeah. And that was once. Do you know what it was about him that just gave you that feeling? Yeah, he's just still very extremely homicidal. He was just, uh, he was he was a different guy that day. I mean, people, I, I think we all felt a little bit, I felt certainly a little bit, not that I've ever been really nervous in there, but he could just, there was, just, there was underpinnings there that were not completely. And just hairpin trigger rage or just Yeah, like, that's uh, exactly. Which is, I think he's just still in that whole loop. I think he was arrested not very long after. Uh, oh, it was only hours after he'd actually killed his parents. Yeah. And so I think he's still in that kind of like, you know, he's just extremely unpredictable. And yeah, I mean, we, that's one of the things we'll never understand as the why. Have you ever gotten it wrong <laughs> where you were sure you had the right guy? Oh, man, that's a good qu- That's a great question. Uh, have I ever knowingly been involved in a wrongful conviction of somebody? Like, have I ever been involved in a case where we've convicted somebody and then learned out later that it was a wrongful conviction? No. Um, have I been involved in cases where we had a theory that it was going to be A, and then through the course of the investigation, end up focusing on B? Yeah. That has happened several times. And some of us, some of our highest profile crimes actually began with the focus on an A and then the investigation switching to a B. So that does happen. There's a bunch of things that help safeguard that. I'll be proud to say it. I Long gone are the days that a lonely detective goes out to a crime scene in the middle of the night with his fedora, sparks up a cigar, <laughs> standing under a street lamp, looking cool, and handles it all from the beginning to the middle to the end. Everything that we do is done through a team approach. Teams are great because collectively as a group, there's a whole bunch of different opinions. We don't always jive with what each other is saying, which helps reduce the possibility of, say, tunnel vision, which is the bane of an investigation. It is the number one reason why people are wrongfully convicted. On a team of eight, there's everybody in there takes turns being the devil's advocate on different things. Because we work within the team, in teams, and we follow evidence, not theory, which is huge, we reduce the the likelihood or the probability that we could uh, name the wrong guy. I'm not here to say that I don't think that bias can creep in at different points in time. I mean, I think everybody is human and we're sort of programmed to have some biases, right? However, what I can say um, unequivocally is, is that there's never been a time in an investigation where we haven't accepted information. Yeah. Like we don't close the door and say, no, we don't want any more information on this because we're not interested in solving it. And that is not something that ever happens. This kind of all steps into sort of the next piece to all of this when it comes to homicide investigation or any kind of crime. The police are the public and the public are the police. But the police are paid full time attention to the interference of the law. Right. But it doesn't take away your responsibility as a member of the public to also step in and be the police when you need to be the police. When you're called to do that. When you're called and asked to come forward with information. It is why it's so important that we continue to work with communities, all communities, to try and develop that trust. Because if we don't have it, when those communities are affected by violence and violent crime and things of Mm -hmm. that nature, we are not going to have the opportunity to uh, solve those cases properly. And in turn, it propagates this belief that we don't care. And that is the furthest thing from the truth. I've heard a number of cases where neighbors heard things. They heard they heard things, and they didn't they didn't call anybody because they either didn't want to get involved, or they figured, oh, they don't they won't come, they won't do anything, you know. And before the police show up at anybody's worst day, there was a number of breakdowns that occurred prior to that ever happening. The police are going to be the last person in that in the uh, in the line 
and they're the ones that are at the pointy end of the stick. We may have people in our families that we think, you know what, there's just something about my daughter's boyfriend that really bothers me. But I don't want to upset my daughter, so I'm never going to say anything to her mm -hmm. about it. There may be people that um, know half people in their families that know that they're, they're suffering from a mental illness, but they choose to ignore that mental illness because they don't want to make the person feel whatever about yeah. it. As we ignore things all the way along the way, it ends with a crisis at the end. And then it's left for the police to basically backstop or clean up. It's the police action that represents the tragedy in the case. But the tragedies often st this tragedy often started many years earlier. I can think of off the top of my head at least three child homicides that we were involved in over the years. Or when you go out and you start to talk to the neighbors and things, they say, you know, I thought there was something weird going on there. You know, it didn't make sense that this was happening. You know, one day I saw this. In all of those cases, it kind of, it stopped there. Months later, no one is surprised to learn that the, the little one was murdered. That's what I mean. We have, we, have a, we have a role in our community to act on our observance. So when we see something that we know is not right, yeah. we have to stand up and say something. Forensics on its own is not going to save, solve a case. I mean, from your own experience, you'll, you, you, you've, you've probably saw. You still need talking heads to come to court and stand up and say things. You still need that. It's a big part of the investigation. DNA evidence seems irrefutable, but it's definitely not infallible yep. because you can't date that type of evidence. You can't date fingerprints. You don't know when a fingerprint was laid or not laid down. You know, these are, these are things where we think, well, that's conclusive evidence, but it really isn't. CCTV video, how many times have we watched things and thought we were like looking at something that we can't identify the person from the video. Videos, if families are waiting us for us to get the perfect video yeah. that's going to identify the crime uh, or the criminal, they could be waiting a very long time. There's always been a part of me that would like to go to talk to Dustin in prison and say why, but he's going to mitigate his portion of it. I'm not going to get the answer. And even if he sat down and said, I was thinking these thoughts on that day, I would still wonder why, because it's not in my anything that I could ever think to do. So Here's the thing. I make that, I make that statement about understanding the why, and I come, come at it from a complete place of naivety. I've never been a victim of violent crime. I can only make that statement from what I see successful families be able to do versus families that struggle after, mm -hmm. uh, like a, a murder or a violent death. The ones that seem to do the best are the ones that stop fixating on the why and start focusing more on legacy. The people that get really consumed of why did this happen, why did this happen, they get so buried and angry about it mm -hmm. that it kind of takes them down too. I've talked to lots of bad guys over the years, and if they do end up making admissions or even providing a full confession on what they did, it's always watered down, it's always minimized, it mm -hmm. always comes back to their drug addiction or their alcohol addiction mm -hmm. or the fact that they were abused as a child. or And those things are all absolutely valid. That might be one of the reasons for why it happened. That might be it's in their background, but I don't know that that brings any extra satisfaction to a family. Sometimes people just completely, yeah, they just they actually make up a set of facts and they'll say, you know, well, I did this, but it was because I was defending myself. I'm always just very wary of the why because the why always comes from the person that committed the crime. It's also easy to want that person to suffer. Yes. Um, and maybe they don't ever suffer because yeah. they're not thinking of the world the same way I... Like if I ever, God forbid, hit someone with my car or something, I would suffer every day for the rest of my life for doing that because it's something that I would ever want to have happen. But somebody who maybe goes ahead and murders somebody, they don't, they're not thinking the same way. So they're right. not suffering. They're not living in that same right. suffrage the way that I, I would. That's right. 
So you're not going to get that satisfaction either. No. So you need to just move forward, I think. And Families that can move past mm -hmm. anger, move past why, actually can enjoy on some level, enjoy is maybe not the right word, aspects of their life will be enriched uh, through what they find are affir affirmations that their loved one is still around them. They don't want you to be sitting and, no. and sad all the time and angry and... Yeah, you know, so. well, that's true. Do you guys still use lie detector tests? Yeah, and I think that it's that more of it's more of serving sort of an elimination process for mm -hmm. us. They're difficult to tough to beat. I'm certainly not a polygraphist that I would be completely irresponsible to even try to talk about how effective they are and things, but I can tell you that within the last four years and I think I'm a very accomplished I think I can t spin a pretty good story from all of my yeah. undercover work and I tried to beat it and I couldn't you couldn't no not yeah. even close one in three women will report some level of abuse in their lifetime and 85% of the time the people that are abusing are men and so it is also critically important that as men we be part of the conversation when it comes to uh, dealing with domestic we need to raise better men we and who, we do who don't see a drunk girl and think that she looks like something to have sex with instead right. maybe let, let's get her home safe you know? right and that's i mean that it, it really comes back to the t that's where men have a huge part to play in this like mm -hmm. if we want to stop intimate partner violence and we want to stop intimate partner abuse we want to do this stuff if we are the problem 85 mm -hmm. percent of the time then we have to be part of the solution historically i don't know that necessarily that has always happened i i'm hoping that more men will become involved in this conversation uh as we move on and we recognize our own role so that when we're raising our sons that we're raising them to be strong, confident people, but also with a great respect for girls, for women, and mm -hmm. that. Where do they get that from? They get it from us. Their fathers, their grandfathers, their uncles. We are the ones that are going to influence that behavior in those kids, in those boys, through our own actions and attitudes towards relationships. For Fathers that are raising daughters, same thing. We have to, be, we have to absolutely 1,000% make sure that our daughters we're raising are confident, have a strong belief in themselves. Have you ever had a case where you know who did it, but you just haven't been able to get the evidence, or, uh, or maybe the case was dismissed on a technicality that just... Well, technicalities are pretty hard to come by when it comes to homicides. At least in the Canadian criminal justice system, I don't know about the American one, but the technicality has to be so egregious for it not even to pass uh, a test under something called twenty four. It's section twenty four two. If there's a if there's a breach or a technicality that the evidence couldn't go in, I guess somebody could come, you know, get off on a technicality. But because it's homicide, almost everything will get in. Mm -hmm. Including the Mr. Big stings. Uh, Mr. Big is a little bit different. They're almost considered to be unreasonable unless they can be proven to be reasonable, right? Like the onus is back on the crown to prove that the, the undercover operation was, was sort of done in accordance to a number of rules that were outlined by a case called Hart. So are they, are they not doing them as often then as a result of that? Because they were really popular for a while. Undercover operations have always been part of homicide investigation. I think they probably always will be. We've been very good, like when the heart decision came out, it really didn't affect business for us. Because I think we were doing a lot of the things that Hart was discussing. Yeah. I'm, I'm always shocked and surprised that they work as well as they do. Yeah. You would think that they yeah. wouldn't, but then again, I'm looking at it from a person of normal societal norms, totally. as opposed to, to somebody different. Only 30% of people that apply for parole serving on a life sentence, ever get a chance to spend one day outside of an institution. And although we attach the number... Yeah, we hear that all the time, 25 to life. And I think a lot of people think, well, does that? what does that mean? Does that mean 25 right. or their life? No. comes first? A life sentence in Canada means until your heart stops beating. 
you will be under some form of incarceration or custody. When you are convicted of either first or second degree murder, you will receive a life sentence and they will attach a number to it. The number will be anywhere between 10, which would be the minimum, up to 25. Those numbers represent a parole eligibility date. That's all they represent. So when you get up to your 23rd year, or your 25th year, whenever it is that your parole eligibility date is coming up, you can apply for parole, but parole is not a guarantee. It's not an automatic after 25 you're out. There's a, you have to apply, the parole board has to agree. They only agree in 30% of cases. It's very low, only three in 10. Some people don't ever apply. So they stay in jail for the rest of their life. This is what allows our Canadian criminal justice system to keep people like Paul Bernardo, uh, Clifford Olson before he died mm -hmm. in custody for the rest of their lives. They committed heinous crimes. Bernardo was responsible for the deaths of Kristen French, Leslie Mahaffey. Mm -hmm. Clifford Olson was responsible for multiple murders of children in BC. Both have had parole dates come up both have not been provided those dates mm -hmm. and they continue to serve on their life sentence if you are one of the lucky ones that gets out then you go into supervision for the rest of your life so if you get out at 13 years for example and one of the conditions upon your parole board puts into place is, is that you're to stay away from drugs and alcohol and you stay clean and sober for eight years and then on your ninth year the parole officer goes and finds out that you've been using drugs and alcohol, you go right back to jail to continue serving on your life sentence. Do you find now over your years of experience that you have, you are your own lie detector? Like you can see it? No, or? I can't. I mean, you can sometimes, right? There are yeah. telltale signs of somebody that, you know, is... The bad liars, you know. Or responsible <laughs> for something. If you want to appear guilty, come into an interview room, put your head down on the table and fall asleep. That's a tactic that some will take to not talk to us, mm -hmm. but it speaks volumes in terms yeah. of their in involvement in a file. Yeah. Because uh, nobody in their right mind is going to come in and sleep if they've been arrested for murder. But that happens lots. Um, you know what? I've been tricked so many times. You're years ago i was involved in a case where i interviewed a guy and i came out of the interview and i had said his girlfriend was missing and i had said oh, well i don't know i don't think this guy has anything to do with this i said I, we need to go back into her background again and start looking into some of these other things and a year later we were moving her body from a, a sarcophagus in a basement you know his basement so um, it's, you know, for those that can say that they can absolutely tell their 